Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes, its history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roke. I'm a voiceover artist, host, producer, writer, blah, 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 over at Collider Video. And uh, um, I am not a horror aficionado, as some of you may know. You know, Perry Nemiroff and Haley and all those over there at Collider, they cover that. But... I do love good horror, and I'm excited that we're getting a chance to sit down and talk about this film, Steve. I am also not a horror aficionado, <laughs> and I am. This is one of the ones I've been most nervous about doing since the beginning of the podcast. Okay, like there've been a few episodes every once in a while where I was much more nervous about them, and this is one of them because I'm not a horror guy, mm -hmm. and. Like yes, there have been there have been films that I had never seen before that we had to do on the show, right. but they always existed within genres that I was very familiar with or were directors I was familiar with. And this is like, I have seen this movie once before. Yeah, it was like sometime in the late eighties. I watched it and then I watched it again a few days ago. And while I yes, I have seen I've seen uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. I've seen Friday the Thirteenth. I've seen Scream. I've seen right. a few of these. But I didn't watch all these horror films. And so this is not my genre. And so A, it's a movie I haven't seen very much. B, it's a genre I don't know very well. Yeah. And now I have to pretend to be an expert on it for the next hour and a half. And that's <laughs> a little, I'm a little nervous about doing it. I, I, I've done some research. We're going to do our best. Yeah, well, sometimes I think it's best to be outside of it. You know, a little bit. Some horror aficionados get so worshiping the material or slavish to the material that they can't step outside of it and look at it objectively. So I, I'm actually looking forward to hearing what you have to say about it. Well, and I mean, this has been a movie that has been requested so much, mm -hmm. both on, on, on Facebook, on Twitter. When are you going to do John Carpenter's Halloween? When are you going to do Halloween? And it's a Patreon pick from not one, not two, but three patrons. Yeah. So uh, Sean Higgins, Jake Blackman, and Jono, I'm going to say this the wrong way, but uh, Schaffer Cotter. Um, all, all pick this as their Patreon pick, and I would love to hear from them. What is it about Halloween that made you want to hear us talk about it on The Cinephiles? Hey, Steve and John. This is Jono from Santa Cruz, California, and today you're talking 1978 classic Halloween. This is one of my favorites because, like Psycho or Night of the Living Dead, it really changed filmmaking. I love it for all the technical work, panic glide, long take, score, editing, of course. But the piece that makes it truly special is the fact that Michael Myers rides the line between psychopath and supernatural being. With Michael, I really feel like you can kill him, but I'm not 100% sure. And that's pretty scary. Thanks for letting me say a few words about the movie, and I can't wait to hear what y'all think. Hi, John and Steve. This is Jake Blackman from Houston, Texas. I saw John Carpenter's Halloween for the first time when I was 10 years old, and 16 years later, it still scares me to this day. It's a total package you'd want in a horror movie. The atmosphere, the mood, the scares, the shadows, the tension, John Carpenter's chilling score and memorable performances from Donald Pleasance and Jamie Lee Curtis, but most importantly, the boogeyman himself, the shape, Michael Myers. It was the night he came home. Hey, John and Steve. This is Sean from Minneapolis, Minnesota. John Carpenter's Halloween is a special film to me, as it is one of the first horror films that I saw that really influenced my love of classic horror movies, was a huge stepping stone to horror becoming my favorite film genre, and is to this day my absolute favorite horror film. This film introduced me to the great director, John Carpenter, who I would now easily list as one of my top five favorite directors. Halloween is soaked to the brim with atmosphere and suspense. Between the excellent cinematography and John Carpenter's brilliantly chilling score, every shot of this film feels like Michael Myers is just there in the background, lurking around any corner, even when he's not on screen. Also, this film contains one of my favorite monologues in horror film history, delivered by Donald Pleasance, as well as the great screen queen, Jamie Lee Curtis. This movie is a perfect film for me to watch every Halloween night, and it still scares me to this day. I am really excited to hear you guys talk about the one, the only, the classic Halloween. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very I mean, I, you That's know. That's great stuff. It's great stuff. Yeah, it was fun to listen to that. So... I normally, of course, I ask you how you first came to the film. Yeah. I t already told you mine. It was somewhere in the late 80s. Um, but I also wanted to ask you, 
how you came to horror. Like what, like what are your, when did, were, were there things, because I can tell you some of my early yeah, experiences, yeah, yeah. like what is your feeling about the genre that we've done not as much of? Well, I've talked about this before on at Collider, but I'll, I'll say it again, like for those who maybe don't follow me there, but like my number one, my first exposure to horror was Nosferatu. Oh yeah, that's yeah. You heard said that before. That's yes, right. I've talked about that because I, I was a kid and I was like being babysat by a seventy-one-year-old Latina lady, Senora Lucila, who fell asleep while she was watching me when my parents were out on a date, and uh, I woke. I like flipping channels while she was asleep. Fell, uh, stumbled onto Nosferatu, which was insane to watch at seven years old. Oh my god, sepia tone, seeing. I just, I will always remember. Uh, him coming out of the darkness with yeah. that those long fingers and the bald head and the that weird face, face, yeah, and the shadow on the stairs as it climb as he climbs up the stairs in a way. So it would scare the hell. I couldn't take my eyes off it, but it scared the hell out of me. I would throw in Jaws as well, seeing that at a young right. age, very much a horror film in my mind. Um, but with Halloween. I came to Halloween on NBC. Like they showed it as right. a movie of the week. And I remember watching it. And I was probably 12 years old the first time yeah, I watched sense. it. 79, 80. Yeah. 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 Oh, right. no, you'd be a little later. Right. right yeah. But it would be, it would, yeah. that's when it would show, 80s, right? Yeah. 282 or something like yeah. that. It would probably show it. And I, I remember watching it and just being like overwhelmed by the subject matter, the material, and that opening. That opening has always shook me, seeing it through the mask. Yep. And the breathing sound, you know what I'm saying? And then the pull off of the mask and the pull away. Like, all of that always affected me. So it's a film I've always come back to over and over again as, like, the best of horrors. Well, it, it's funny. For me, when I was... I think I might have mentioned this on the show before. I'm not sure. Mm. But when I was five years old, The Exorcist came out. Oh, God. And I didn't see it. Okay. But <laughs> every time the commercial came on... Oh, the trailer. It scared me so much I was behind the couch. Like I literally would hide and I have the memory of just like being so terrified of just the ideas of that. And then I remember like, I'm sure you were on the camping trip or on the, you know, sleepover or whatever, where people start telling the ghost stories oh, yeah, of course. and you tell the story about the the guy with the hook and mm -hmm. you know, the someone in the back of the car and all these, and then someone might yeah. come out of the woods screaming at the scary moment in the scared the crap out of me. Yeah. Like, and I was, that was cause I have such a vivid imagination and certainly at that time, I had no control over my imagination. So right. I was up all night, yeah. you know, and even though, and I would have this sort of, you know, this isn't real, you know, this isn't true, but what if there's just a little chance that that guy is out there in the woods and I'm in my sleeping bag or whatever, just freaking myself out mm -hmm. all night. Oh yeah. And so horror was never something I sought out. And of course there's a certain point where, you know, I was 18, I was 19 years old and you're with the, the gang and they all want to watch a horror movie and you can't wimp out. So I watched them. And, and, and I pre and, and and the there's the movies that some of them that we've already talked about like The Shining and Jaws and Alien that were so good that I did see them and did appreciate them. Mm -hmm. But when it came to like this group of slasher films, I mostly just stayed away. Yeah. I saw I think I saw the I saw a few of each of them mm -hmm. and mostly just didn't seek them out at all. Wow. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about pre-production. So this starts after John. Car you, it's, by the way, it's so weird that this is our third John Carpenter movie. Can't go. Can, we can't go near a Hitchcock film. But we can knock down all these John Carpenter we're, films. Let's let's just can we say on the air that like in the month of sure, November sure. we're gonna do the Hitchcock. <laughs> sure. so, so, we should make a month of Hitchcock. That wouldn't be a bad I, idea. I, I don't. It's a, you know what? Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. I don't all know right. if it's gonna. I don't think it could be November, but it's let's do. Yeah. Let's have a month. What's it? What's in the month of Hitchcock? Uh, Vertigo. Vertigo, absolutely. Rear Window, probably. Or Psycho. Or Psycho. Uh, the Birds, maybe? I'm not as big as fan Okay, of the what birds. about 39 Steps? Oh, do like the nice... That's a really good one. I love the 39 Steps. So maybe we'll do a full month of Hitchcock. Yeah, those are all criteria. All right, what do you guys say? We, I, here, here's oh, let's, let's, put, let, let's put it out to the fans. Yeah. We're going to do a month of Hitchcock, and we want to hear what, what, what is the things you are most interested in. I'm yeah. not guaranteeing that we're going to do them all. No, no, no. But, but say, tell us what you're interested in. Maybe we can figure out a way to do... When we did the month of Kane, we did a whole episode just mm -hmm. talking about Orson. Oh, we could do a whole episode talking about Alfred Hitchcock. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I know so much more about Orson Welles than I know about uh, Hitchcock. Right. But but we give us a little time. We sure. can we can get there. I'm sure we can get there. Absolutely. We can get there. Or make it a Patreon conversation where it's only there twenty or twenty five okay. minutes. Okay. So That'd so be fun. anyway, yeah. It's strange that we've done three John Carpenters. <laughs> um, it's a very. That's, but I don't think it's that strange considering our points of views about movies. That's right. our, the things that we enjoy watching over and over again. But and, yes, and film fans. 
like us, yeah. love John Carpenter. Yeah, exactly. Um, so he had just done Assault on Precinct 13, and the producers of that said, hey, we want to do a horror film. And this is what they came to him with. Halloween, Boogeyman, Babysitters. That's it. That was the whole pitch. And basically, Carpenter said, I can do that. He got paid 10 grand, I think, for the script, wow. directing and composing. Good God. And a percentage of the film. It worked out okay for him. (laughs) And his whole deal was, but I get total artistic control, which he did. That's fine for 10 grand. And he brings in uh, Deborah Hill is the producer and co-wrote with him. And what's fascinating to me is that she worked on Assault as a script supervisor and assistant editor. Right. And then the next film, she is the producer. She must have been a hell of a script supervisor, and assistant editor. It I sounds bet. like it sounds like she's awesome, and she's gone on to produce a ton of other films. Mm-hmm. And the way they divided up the writing is awesome. She had been a babysitter. She wrote all the babysitting stuff, all the women. Oh wow! And Carpenter wrote all the Doctor Loomis stuff and the sheriff stuff. Okay. Um, and then they would kind of throw things back and forth at each other to rewrite each other's stuff. And and all they started with was a list of scares. They wanted, they thought about like the classic haunted house, the classic sort of what are the things that suburban young people are scared of? Yeah. The boogeyman, the haunted house, the, you know, the all alone and the the parents are gone, all those things. And they just said, okay, let's, how do we add all of those things to our movie? Right. Um, and they took, he, he loves Hitchcock. There's a lot of Hitchcock references in here. Oh, there you go. Um, and they got $300,000 and they shot it in 20 days in Pasadena, a little bit in West Hollywood. And that's all, that's how they made this film. Wow. Yeah. 20 days. 20 days. Good God. Well, this is a low budget indie film, yeah. you know? Well, like this most recent remake, Steve, only $10 million. Wow. And at this recording, it has made $130 million domestically. Wow. You've made your money. Oh, and yeah. Then some. And then some. Yeah. Hey, did you see it? I have not. Yeah. I will absolutely I've heard be it's going pretty soon. good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard good things too. Uh, shall we get jump into the movie? Absolutely. So we start with that music. This, I think, is both the most recognizable John Carpenter score, and it's probably his best score. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, It definitely sounds a lot like the music from The Exorcist, which is tubular bells. And I don't know if he was consciously trying to make it sound like The Exorcist, but if you play both of them, I have to take a minute to go, wait, which one is this? Because they're very, very similar. Um, it's in five, four time, which is an unusual, it's got that driving fast time signature. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I love by the way that, he, so he scored it in three days. That's how long it took him to do it. Wow. And he's playing the music, but he credits it to the Bowling Green Philharmonic Orchestra oh. of which there is none. <laughs> That's just Bowling Green's where John Carpenter is from. Nice. And we go into credits and we see a jack-o'-lantern. Yeah. It's creepy. And I love that, yes, the camera is slowly pushing into the jack-o'-lantern, but what it really looks like is the jack-o'-lantern is slowly coming for you. Yeah. I think what's amazing, uh, Steve, is it's 1978. It took this long to do a horror movie centered around Halloween. Wow. That's a great point. Right? Like, there's not much around horror films before 1978 that are focused on any kind of holidays, and they're more about, like, sci-fi horror type things and not so much this kind of thing. Um, that's a, that's a really great point. Mm. Well, cause yeah, cause there's creature from the black lagoon and there's all the, right. And the blob and Frankenstein and Dracula. Yeah. yeah, All that kind of stuff. Actually, I think that is a fantastic point because what is this thing centered on? This is centered on young people and their experience. It's not the classic old Dracula stories and things like that. It's centered on you're the trick or treater. You're the babysitter in very, like we've never been to Transylvania yeah, yeah, yeah. or ancient Egypt. Like these aren't places, but I've been on that suburban street. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's honestly, that's pretty close to how I grew up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because I'm suburban. I mean, so I'm a little, I'm, I'm Tommy. Mm-hmm. Like that's exactly my age. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. that is how I grew up on a suburban street where everyone trick or treated and the parents were kind of gone. And yeah, it's my world. Plus I wonder when like the idea of babysitters was an accepted Thing. Like, what was the year that as a society we accepted the idea of babysitters? Or have there always been babysitters? That's interesting. That's what I like to explore, too. I have no idea. That's an interesting question. I mean, of course, there have always been people taking care of other people's kids. Right. But at what? And Did of course, family. Right. Well, and, and, and you know, if we were in the old village in the huts, yeah. then the, gir- the girl who was 14 was taking care of a bunch of kids. Right. But the babysitter format 
of what, what, that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm sure it's something of the 20th century. Yeah, that would be my assumption. I feel like it has to be. Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, were you ever a babysitter? Uh no. I have watched kids with girlfriends who were babysitters when I was in high school and uh, a little bit my first couple of years in college. But yeah. So I've had that experience, but I was definitely a babysitter. Oh, from, you were from oh, wow. ten or eleven on. It's funny thinking about it today because mm. I would get paid twenty five cents an hour to go take care of the Rosen's kids or the Candell's kids or like there are all sorts of kids I babysat right. until I was fourteen or fifteen, and then started working as a gardener and then working in the ice cream store. Wow! But babysitting was the first job that I had. Um, so we move into as you mentioned this first shot. Yeah, their inspiration for this opening is Touch of Evil. Brilliant. Yeah. That makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Because it is one long tracking shot yep. where we have, we're in this person's POV. And again, we're in the early days of Steadicam. So yeah. that allowed us to do all these things. And we're, we're kind of looking at this house in this neighborhood and we're hearing kids trick or treating. Yeah. And we kind of see this doorway and something's moving around in the door. And we look in through the window and there are two teenagers that are kind of making out. <laughs> <laughs> and this is an important theme in, in this kind of film yeah. is that in general, sex is bad. Yeah. <laughs> is that you are going to get in trouble if point. you have some sex. Yep. Well, this is one of the weird things in, you know, the, in t reading about the uh, criticism and studying of this film is there's a lot of people trying to interpret what does all this really mean? And there is a whole school that says oh. these movies are are essentially conservative because they are are punishing promiscuity. The slasher films, yes, slasher yeah, films. Okay, all right, yeah, because the the you have the characters who are mm -hmm. drinking and smoking and breaking the rules and having sex, and they are going to get killed. Yeah, well, I I can't say that I've ever thought that. I don't think that's what it is, but yeah. there are lots of people who have talked about it. Fascinating. Okay. Um, and uh, so anyway, they're 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 kind of fooling around in there, and and it's kind of cute. Yeah. And they go upstairs, and this POV shot is watching, and then there's this music sting, and this is something we're going to get a lot when the lights go off upstairs, and the POV moves around back. And goes into the house and there's turns a light on in the kitchen and we see a green clad shiny arm reach and into a drawer and grab a big honking knife. Yeah. And that arm hand, by the way, is Deborah Hills, the producers, <laughs> I believe. Um, and we move in through the dining room, past the couch, to the stairs, and the tension is really high. It is. Yeah. I mean, it is definitely slow and scary. Uh, and we could just barely hear the voices, but you can't really hear what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And the guy comes out, pull, puts his shirt on, goes out the front door. Yeah. We look up the stairs. It's dark up there. We head up the stairs. We see something on the ground, and it's a mask. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing through the mask. This is where it gets really creepy, I yeah. think. Yeah. Very voyeuristic. Very much so. And we walk into a room, and there's a naked woman... Brushing her hair. Not even woman. Yeah. A, a, girl, a teenager. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and she turns and screams the word Michael. Yeah. And he starts stabbing her. Michael! And it is so... It's it's so funny because I can't I wish I knew what it was like to see this movie in 1978 because yeah. of course I know what's I know who Michael Myers is right you right. know what I mean like I kind of know what's going to happen whereas in 1978 there'd never been anything like this right I think this must have been really really shocking yeah I think it has a lot of homages to Hitchcock obviously but I also think in that moment it's very it feels reminiscent of Jaws oh the, totally the girl screaming Chrissy, yeah uh, unable to stop it, what's happening and that situation yeah yeah um, and. Michael goes back down the stairs, opens the front door. There's a car pulling up. It's kind of hard to see. Yeah. And the, up come the parents, and they pull off the mask, and you see this kid. Michael? In a full clown outfit with a bloody knife, mm -hmm. and the camera just pulls back and back and back as the parents stare at their son. I love that score. Uh, as it's pulling back. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Just the kind of feeling of arrested development. It that the same note plays for such a long time as you're pulling away that it feels like arrested development kind of symbolism. The kid will never get past this moment. Well, I no one will. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's fun. It's funny because 
that kid's probably about the age of my kid. Yeah, it's crazy, right? You know, and you yeah. think, and I don't know if you've ever, I'm sure you've been online and click and mm. maybe made the mistake of clicking on one of those look at serial killers pictures as kids. Oh, yeah. And you see Jeffrey Dahmer as a kid or, yeah. you know, some of these guys, and it's just, there he is. It's Michael Myers. Yeah. That's who this is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now we are. 15 years later in mm -hmm. Smith Grove, Illinois, and it's a rainy night, and we're in a station wagon, and there is Donald Pleasance. <laughs> the great Dr. <laughs> Loomis. Dr. Loomis. Yeah. So he he's obviously the name in the movie, mm -hmm. and uh, the first person they went after was Peter Cushing, who had just done Star Wars. Oh, that makes so much sense. And he wouldn't do it, and then they went after Christopher Lee, which of course makes perfect sense. Yes. And then they go to Pleasance, and Pleasance got $20,000 for five days' work, which is you know, seems yeah. that seems right to me. Yeah, sure. And it's funny. So the first thing he says to John Carpenter is, uh, he says, I don't understand it. I don't like your script. I don't know who my character is. But my daughter thought your first movie was cool. So tell me why I'm doing this. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Which I think is sort of a great way to start. Yeah. Um, and this totally freaked uh, Carpenter out. And what he found out later on after they had kind of become friends was, that's a test. Oh wow! Pleasance does that to all the directors. Ah. He wants to see how they, where, they, what they really think. Interesting. He's just kind of messing with him. I love that. Yeah. So he's driving with this nurse in the rain, mm -hmm. and uh, we kind of start talking about has she done this before? And no, she's only done minimum security. Right. And this is clearly something more serious. And she knows, like, why are you so worried about this guy? I mean, he hasn't spoken in fifteen years. Yeah. And he keeps going, no, you can't underestimate it. He keeps using that word, it. Don't you think we could refer to it as him? If you say so. The thing that's great about his performance, especially in this opening scene, Steve, is, is he is as creepy as we're about to yeah. experience with Michael, but in a different way. He's very affected, almost walking that line of overdramatic about the situation, right? But yeah. he believes it so earnestly, so powerfully, that you can't help but feel connected to this guy because he feels almost helpless yeah. throughout the whole movie about what's happening. Well, and I think if this were a different kind of movie, he'd be a bad guy. Yes. Because he's so adamant yeah. about how horrible this he was he is there's no compromise he knows the absolute truth and it's like man you could totally see a movie where there's the crazy psychiatrist keeping someone drugged up in sure. there i mean that's a that's a perfectly reasonable villain yeah. to have yeah. but that is not the case in the myths movie no he is correct yeah. um and he and they, they talk about well that that they have to take him out because he has to go in front of some judge mm -hmm. and she asks well what 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 are we going to put get, put him on sarazine barely be able to sit up that's the idea yeah um and they're just doing this because this is the law and they pull in and there's very vaguely you can see through the rain there are a bunch of guys in white who are yeah. out it's scary it is creepy yeah. to see and it's part of it is because you can't really see exactly what you're seeing right and it's and just like wait something something's wrong is going on mm -hmm. and they stop and she says shouldn't we go on up to the hospital and wait he gets out of the car and heads up to the gate. He's not very helpful. No. <laughs> this doesn't seem like such a great plan. He's very much uh, one thing on his mind, one track mind. Yeah. His pursuit is Michael Myers. Yeah. Well, and unfortunately, though, <laughs> Michael Myers yeah. is already out. Yeah. Because we hear the crazy music and we have this shot through the rear windshield as Michael Myers jumps on the car. That's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, she opens the window. <laughs> Which is not the right choice. No. And that arm comes in. It is scary and creepy. And this is like those stories from around the campfire mm -hmm. of there's someone in the back of your car, of the guy with the hook, of yep. those creepy stories that freaked me out so much when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, and she manages to get the car in gear and drives, and then she's lying down in the car, and the hand comes down and breaks the window on the other side behind her. And she manages to get away. She gets out, she runs out of the car, falls into the mud, and the car drives away, and that's when Loomis comes up. Right. And he says, he's gone. <laughs> the evil is gone. If you stop here, what do we have? We have a, we have ki a kid. We have a kid. We assume that this kid has now an adult 15 years later and broken out of this prison. He seems big. Yes. Scary. Agile. 
Yep. Strong. Yeah. But we have no background information. No. We don't know what Loomis saw in conversations with this guy. We have just what we've been presented. And it still works so perfectly. Well, I think that's part of why it works. Yes. And this is what Carpenter says about it, is that he didn't want any background information. No. He said the point of Michael Myers is he is pure evil. Yes. That is what that is what is going to scare us. If you the more detail you give us, the less scary he's going to become. The more like a human he'll be. Right. And that's not what he wants. No, which is why the Rob Zombie Halloweens are terrible. Right. I've never seen any of them. Nor should you ever. Yeah. Uh, but that's the thing, yeah. So anyway, go ahead, yeah. Uh, so we're in Haddon, back in Haddonfield, which is the town that he came from, and it's Halloween, and we see some beautiful fall leaves falling, and there's this kind of sleepy suburban town, and the camera slowly moves in on a house. And this is something I wanted to talk about, which is that the camera moves throughout this film are totally unlike anything I think has ever been seen before. Yeah. Which is it's always creepy. It always gives you that feeling of... POV like we saw yeah, in the yeah, beginning yeah. of the film. Is someone watching me? Is someone behind me? Mm -hmm. Am I not seeing everything? It's, it has a sense of being a voyeur throughout the film. I mean, it always feels like danger is just right out of sight. Yep. Just out of sight yeah. of your right, left, or top, bottom. Like right. just out of sight. Well, and the characters are oblivious to it. Yes. You know, so we're constantly going like, no, don't don't be someone's behind <laughs> you, someone's in front of you. Stop, stop, stop. Uh, and we get to meet Jamie Lee Curtis yes. in her film debut. Very beautiful Jamie Lee Curtis. She is beautiful. I've always loved Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, um, she's great. And, uh, you know, of course, she's the daughter of Tony Curtis and Janet Lee, mm -hmm. the star of Psycho. So, so Carpenter <laughs> definitely knew that there was something cool about having her in this. She had yeah. done some TV, TV work, but she's really new mm -hmm. when she does this. And she's great in the film. Yes, she is. We hear something about a guy saying you got to leave a key under a mat. We don't quite get what it is. And she right. starts, she walks off and starts heading down the street. And there's that creepy music. And, and this is the thing about it that I think it does very well, which is that, first of all, it's very familiar. Yeah. It's something we talked about when we talked about Jaws is that part of what makes Jaws so scary is when you're sitting on the beach, it seems totally normal. Oh, yeah. And so does this. This is just some normal town like like I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's so interesting, I think, which is that if you didn't know you were in a horror film and if there weren't creepy music, yeah. this would just be boring. Yeah. Because it's just someone walking down the street. Yeah, that's a good point. But because you know you came to see one of the scariest movies of all time <laughs> and you have that music, every moment is tense. Yeah. We meet Tommy who she's going to babysit for. Right. And we hear that, oh, she's the babysitter. She's going to come over tonight and there's going to be monster movies and popcorn. And they clearly have a good relationship. And then she pulls out this key, which she has to deliver to the Myers house. Yeah, the old Myers house. Which is, did you have a haunted house in your neighborhood? Uh, I don't know if I did. I don't think we ever did. There was definitely a creepy house in our neighborhood. Okay. I don't know that we thought it was a haunted house. Right. But it was like, uh, you didn't want to go over there kind of house yeah i'm i'm sure there was i'm trying to remember if there was but nothing jumps to mind but i'm sure there was um you know and sometimes it's maybe it's the boarded up building or sometimes yeah. it's the the space behind the the railroad track or whatever it is yeah because if you're kids and you're out all the time you will find the creepy place oh yeah you know um and of course he's like you can't go up there right. she has no problem with it she walks up she puts the key under the mat she walks away and we're looking at it through the screen from inside the house yeah and up that head pops up and there is a big music sting and we hear the breathing <sighs> yeah very scary very scary um, Donald uh, Pleasance, Dr. Loomis is talking to this other doctor and they're kind of having an argument about how serious this really is. Nothing else I can do. You can get back in there and get back on that telephone, tell him exactly who walked out of here last night and tell him exactly where he's going. Probably going. I'm wasting my time. Now. Sam Haddonfield is 150 miles away from here now. Now, for God's sakes, he can't drive a car. He was doing very well last night. Maybe someone around here gave him lessons. <laughs> and now we're in class mm -hmm. and... Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, whose name is Laurie, by the way, is there's some I couldn't figure out what book they're talking about, okay. but they're talking about fate and destiny and evil and all these things that naturally relate to sort of what's going on in the uh, in the movie. Right. And um, and Jamie looks out and she sees a station wagon. And for some reason, that station wagon draws her attention. Yeah. And of course, we know the reason. <laughs> um. And she then answers the question of the teacher, and obviously she is one of the smart kids in the class. Mm -hmm. 
And when she goes to look back out the window for the car, it's gone. Right. Again, this is classic structure. I mean, well, well I guess, well, this is the thing. I remember seeing um, My Darling Clementine, John oh, Ford yeah. film. Great film. And I remember, and I was in college, and I saw them slide the drink down the mm. bar and the bat wing doors and the clink of the spurs. And I went, oh, this movie is just filled with cliches. Right. And then I went, oh, this is where they came from. Right. And I think it's, I have the same experience watching Halloween. Oh. You know, is that this is what introduced all of these things yep. that have since become cliches. Uh, school's out. Uh, kids are leaving. A lot of the kids are in costume. And we see Tommy's got a big pumpkin. And a bunch of, you know, not so nice kids are coming after him. Yeah. He's going to get you. 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 Boogeyman is coming. Was that a term for when you was a kid? Oh, the boogeyman? Yeah. Well, even more so because of this film. Right. Kind of reinforced it when you were a kid, this idea of the boogeyman. What is the boogeyman? Who is the boogeyman? Blah, blah, blah. All those kinds of things. Yeah, definitely. There were all sorts of things I was scared of, but I don't think I was actually scared of that word. Like, that wasn't one that was going around. Uh, and he tries to get away, and they trip him, and he falls and smashes that pumpkin, crushing it. Yeah. And one of the kids runs off, runs down out of the school, turns a corner onto the street, and Bam! Right into Michael. <laughs> we don't see his face. Nope. But you get that music sting, and it's obvious with the kid's reaction that he ran into something. Yeah. <laughs> that he's this is not so good. Nope. Um, and the can and again we're sort of in these kind of POV shots as the camera moves behind Michael's back as Tommy walks in the background and they walk together in parallel. Mm -hmm. Still don't see his face. He gets in the car. And now the camera's in the back of the car, and he's kind of tracking Tommy as yeah. we go. And I know there's no answer to this. Why does he focus in on Tommy and on Lori in this film? Is there anything that makes it happen? I don't know. There were the, In the second film, they said it was his sister. Right. His other sister. Mm. But which they retconned out now with this new one. Right. Um, but no, I don't know. We don't know necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just... She's the star of the movie. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and now we're, uh, Dr. Loomis is kind of out in the middle of the nowhere near some train tracks and he's on the phone and he is saying, Because I know him. I'm his doctor. You must be ready for him. If you don't, it's your funeral. And then he walks past this truck and a train goes by. Yeah. Uh, and he finds uh, this matchbox, which was from, which the nurse had used to wipe, write, light her yeah. cigarettes. Uh, which is the red, red, Rabbit in Red Lounge, which I guess that's in the zombie, Rob yeah. Zombie Halloween, yeah. which I didn't know. Um, and he turns to go away, and the camera tracks back, and we see that there's a dead body in this bush. Wow. So, <laughs> did Loomis see the body? It's a good question. Like, how did he get here? Yeah. He's just at a random railroad crossing where there's a truck. He just happens to be there. Right, and he finds the matchbook, but but Michael still has the station wagon. Right. So how did he, I don't understand how? I mean, it's fine, <laughs> but I don't understand because this cause, is the mechanic's body, right? That he finds the mechanic's body. Right, right. But why did this mechanic get killed, and why did Loomis? And because Loomis either saw the body or right. didn't. Well, he gets killed for his clothes, obviously for the clothes, right, right. from Michael. But I don't know if Loomis. Because if Loomis knew that he killed the bo uh, someone, yeah, which he doesn't show any indication that he sees him, right, then he would have told the police, "No, yeah. there's a dead dude right here. He's already killed somebody." Right, and you know he took his clothes. Yeah, but if he doesn't see him, then I'm kind of like, "Well, how did Loomis get here, and what's he doing here?" Right, right. And it, of course, it doesn't really matter. No. So, <laughs> so we'll move on. Um. And we're back at school, and now that we, we we hear some cheerleaders as Lori and her friend Linda are walking away, and they're complaining about cheerleading and dances and school, and and we kind of hear that there's uh, some boyfriends, and we're trying to set up some dates with them. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, uh, the woman playing Linda is her name is P.J. Stoles, and her boyfriend at the time is Dennis Quaid. Oh wow! And Dennis Quaid was almost about to play Bob. Uh, but oh. he had another gig at the time. Huh. Can you imagine if that had been Dennis Quaid in this movie? Wow. Yeah. Uh, but he did not. Okay. And then their friend Annie catches up to them, and we kind of start to heal about... And her name, by the way, is uh, Nancy Keys, I believe. Okay. Um, 
and we start to hear about these boys and you know their right. relationships with them and that Annie has a boyfriend and Linda has a boyfriend and they've got babysitting to do and they're going to try to work out some yeah. sort of plan right in which they can have fun with their boyfriends and also do the babysitting at the same time right and all the while this is going on the camera is behind them following them yep and it is creepy he puts you in his mind a yes. majority of the film. Yeah. It's pretty surprising. Yeah. Well, and sometimes he's not there. Yeah. Sometimes it's just the camera. Right. And sometimes he's following them. Yep. And we don't actually know which is which. Right. And then we, uh, uh, I think Linda goes away and and they start talking and then we see this station wagon. Hey, isn't that Devon Graham? I don't think so. And he just yells at the station wagon. <laughs> hey, jerk. And it stops. Yeah, man. This is a scary moment. Yeah. For us. Yeah. But not for the characters. Well, and this is the thing. I think I mentioned this, and this is something I, I learned from uh, something Hitchcock, I think, said, which is that the audience can either be behind the characters, with the characters, or ahead of the characters. Right. So it's like, what do you know and what do they know? So the example I was using in my class is, let's say there's a bomb buried underneath the underneath my office right now well it could be that you and i have no idea about, about the bomb yeah but the audience knows and they're like you oh my god the bomb's gonna go up shot at steve there's a bomb there's a bomb so they're stressed because we don't know right it could be that we and the audience find out about the bomb at the same time and so right. they discover it when we discover it and now we're digging up trying to do the deal with the bomb right or it could be that the audience comes in and sees you and i with pickaxes and shovels breaking through my floor and right. like what the fuck are these guys doing yeah. because they're behind us this film we are interesting a, yeah so this and they're all they're all perfectly good ways of yeah. dealing with tension sure in, in a thriller or horror situation yeah um and it's just a choice uh hitchcock by the way loves the audience to be ahead of course the audience knows something and the characters don't and that's definitely what's happening in this movie these are just people walking around talking about babysitting boys right. and stuff like that. And we know that there is a crazy killer in that <laughs> station wagon. Yeah. That, but the station wagon drives away. Mm -hmm. And now we kind of go, well, are we on for tonight? And now we hear sort of what the plan is, is that uh, I think it's Bob and Annie have a plan and Linda, or maybe it's Bob and Linda have a plan and George and Annie. I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember the names. Uh, and the plan is, is that they're going to come over to the babysitting houses and that Lori and Annie are babysitting basically across the street. Right. And they're going to use that to hook up with these boys yep. while they're babysitting. Lori, unfortunately, doesn't have a guy to hook nope. up with. Unless she drives them all away. Yep. Point her friends. And uh, Linda leaves, and after she's gone, Lori sees a figure standing yeah. next to this big, huge hedge. Yeah. And Annie doesn't see him. No, because Annie's looking down. Yeah, because she's looking down. And Lori, for some reason, already thinks, like, this is the guy you yelled at who was in yeah. the station wagon. Yeah. Because she looked out the window of the classroom mm -hmm. and saw a station wagon that disappeared. Mm -hmm. And then there was this creepy station wagon. Now there's this creepy guy. Yeah. And Annie goes forward, and there's this slow, scary moment as she peers around the bush. <laughs> hey, creep. It's gone. Yeah. So does Annie say, oh, yeah, there's nobody, nobody here. Nothing no. going on. No, she decides to pull a prank on, uh, on poor Lori Strode. And this is a key thing in, that's another theme that goes throughout the horror movies mm. is the prank. Yeah. Is either someone is pulling a prank on someone else, which which is sort of boy who cries wolf logic. You get pranked a couple of times and yeah. then you don't believe it when it's for real. Or someone thinks a prank is being pulled on them, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, a classic theme that goes, or, or what I think would be called a trope. A trope. The yeah. horror movie tropes. Um and so Lori comes up a little bit scared, and of course, there's nobody there. And then she turns and jump bumps right into Sheriff Brackett. Um, and we get our, another jump scare. Mm -hmm. And again, this is another thing that Carpenter really is sort of the master of introducing yep. is these jump scares. Yep. <laughs> Excuse me, Lori. Oh, Mr. Brackett, I'm sorry, Mr. Brackett. Oh, I didn't mean to startle you. That's all right. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh? So Lori gets home. Here's voices laughing. She sees kids in costume on Halloween. Um, you know, and this is, she smiles. You yeah. know, that she's like, oh, I was being silly. Yeah. There's nothing really to be afraid of. She goes inside her house. The windows are open and air is blowing through the drapes, which is creepy. Yeah. And she goes to close the window and outside, what does she see? Mike. In the mask. Yep. 
in the suit at the clothesline. Um, that is an iconic yeah. image. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty scary. Yeah. Uh, so I was, re- I knew something about how they came to that mask, but I learned out, I learned some more stuff too. Okay. So obviously they didn't have a lot of money. So they send the costume guy off. He goes to Hollywood Boulevard and buys a couple of masks and then he messes with them. He just stresses them. He changes them. The two, the first mask that he has, they have the whole crew gather around and they have someone put on this mask and it's a mask from a guy whose name is Emmett Kelly, I think. And he is a clown, like a classic fifties clown. Right. And he comes out and everyone goes, Ooh, creepy. And they go, okay, good. And then the guy goes back into the dressing room and puts on the dollar eighty William Shatner mask, <laughs> walks outside, and everyone doesn't go, ooh, creepy. They go, Ugh. <laughs> and a chill just goes across the entire crew. And it's something about the blankness of that face yeah. that is just really upsetting. It's an interesting mask, man. It is. Because I think it's the mask based on the animated series oh. Shatner than the original series Shatner. Hmm. It's got that weird kind of blankness to it. Well, and I mean, masks are a lot better now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they didn't, right. they didn't have a lot of good technology then. Right. Um, and they didn't have grown-ups spending hundreds of dollars to get the world's greatest mask like happened today. True. It was, you know, just, I mean, this mask cost a dollar eighty, yeah. which even then was not that much money. No. Um, and of course, she looks back out at the clothesline, and he's gone. Gone. Yeah, which will be something that repeats. Obviously, the hedge thing. Now this yep. this is something that repeats throughout the movie up until the final moment. Yeah, he had, he has Batman level disappearing yeah, skills. Yeah, which makes which that's what is so interesting about the film is it feels realistic. It feels like you can connect to it. This could happen to you, but yet it also feels uh, otherworldly or. Uh, what do they call that? Super, some, what am I? Supernatural. Or? Supernatural, right. yes. Yeah. Supernatural. This idea of this thing that appears, like they even call, like the nickname for him is the shape, right? That's the right. shape. And he's not even the name. Like Michael Myers is the name, but the shape is what they call him. So, so, so to me, it's the mix of the real with the supernatural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is what freaked me out as a kid. Yeah. This is what freaked me out about that commercial for The Exorcist is that. It's the this could happen to you. Right. This is and my brain going, even as a kid, going, well, of course this isn't real. This right. doesn't happen. But there's something about that so grounded in reality. And that's what makes it freaky. Is that whereas I've never been to Transylvania. Right. You know what I mean? Like right. I that doesn't seem real to me. Yeah. This world seems real. Well, it's, yeah, it's like paranormal activity. Have you ever seen paranormal activity? I haven't, because oh. it's probably scared the crap out of me. Yeah. I mean, wow. That feels so natural, like that could happen. And if you're even remotely any way into demons and spirits or right. whatever, that film will fuck you up. Well, and demons and spirits freak me out, yeah. even as an atheist. Yeah. Like, I mean, but it's it, because they're such good stories in a way. Yeah, they are. You know what I mean? They're just so, com- because my my imaginative brain goes, yeah. yeah, but what if? Right. You know what I mean? Like, what what if that is true? Well, and yeah. the thing is, one does not exist without the other. Demons can exist without there being a god or a or, sure. or a angels or anything, or anything for you to believe in. Like demons can exist. Well, once we're into the world of beyond the natural, yeah, anything anything's, po- anything's possible. Yeah, that's right. I don't know. Um, and the phone rings, and there's nobody there. Mm-hmm. Again, that's a horror movie trope. And then it rings again, and it's Annie, and they we're setting up when we're going to meet. And she lies down on the bed, and again, she kind of says, well, this is ridiculous. Yeah, It's because you have to have the character denying, and of course, uh, we're ahead of her, so right. we're like, no, don't, it's not ridiculous. Right. This is a big deal. <laughs> you have to be worried about this. Yeah. And this is one of these things about these movies is the audience going, don't do that. Don't okay. go in that room. Go in the, please stop. Because right. we know we're in a horror movie. Yeah. And they don't. They do not. Yeah. Uh, so she heads outside. She's carrying her pumpkin. She walks down and sits on the post and smiles as we watch all the happy trick or treaters <laughs> walk around this neighborhood. And car pulls up. She gets in it. We got a joint. Yeah, which surprised me um, that Lori smokes a joint. But it's it, the seventies. Sh- yeah, because no one does that today. I just feel like the whole film is about like yeah, yes, you know, you're right about you know youth saying? culture. Yes, yeah. Totally, you're totally right. Yeah, uh, we're back with Donald, who's pulling up in his uh, BMW into a cemetery, and we're with a caretaker mm-hmm. who's kind of talking about, oh, every town has their creepy, scary story. Right. As we're looking for Judith Myers, which is Mike Myers' sister gravestone, and 
you know, of course, he knows that that story as well. And they're walking along and they see an empty spot. Because <laughs> <laughs> just dug into the ground. It just yeah. pulled out a whole big hunk of granite. Yep. And Loomis says, He came home. He came home. <laughs> oh, everything is so Donald Pleasant's I love it. Um he's a he's got a fascinating weird career. Oh yeah, man. I mean it is all over the place. Interesting. Cat. And all these low budget, like mm-hmm. yeah, strange stuff. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh and we're back in the car and uh, Lori and Annie are talking, and who's following that car? Yeah. Station wagon. Yep. And they're of course not aware of it. And now we hear a little bit more that Lori is the perfect Girl Scout. She's the perfect babysitter. Right. She's the brain. And she's not even interested in going to the big dance. They, she suddenly goes, oh, no, it's my dad. Put it away. And we find out that dad is the sheriff. sheriff yeah. And there's an alarm at a hardware store because someone broke in. He thinks it's kids mm-hmm. because they stole a Halloween mask, rope, and a couple of knives. <laughs> <laughs> That to me is like, wow, do kids just break into hardware stores right? to, set, to steal stuff? He stole some lawn darts, some lye, and a rope. Wait, yeah. what? What? <laughs> and it's some tarp. And a tarp. And a tarp. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. And an anatomy book. It's very, yeah, it's very, it's very strange. Weird. And of course, they, they drive away. And Lori is certain that he knew. Which, by the way, you spoke at a joint in a car, and the cop leans in. Yeah. He's going to smell it. I would think he would smell that. Yeah. And then we get into this conversation about the dance. And Annie's just like, you don't care about stuff like that. And there's a long sort of pregnant pause. And Annie kind of picks up and is like, well, why don't you ask someone? Yeah. You know, you could ask somebody. No, I couldn't. Sure you could. All you have to do is go up to somebody and say, you want to go to the dance? You could do that. I couldn't. (laughs) Well, you could ask Dick Baxter. (laughs) He'd go out with you. (laughs) I'd rather go out with Ben Tramer. So she does actually is interested in someone. And this is something that's going to be important and come out later on. And they're like, oh, you actually are like interested in yeah. men and dances because I guess everyone thought she was just the Girl Scout. Right. And of course, the station wagon's following them and we <laughs> hear the music and the sun is going down and then it's yeah. nighttime and they're pulling up to our babysitting houses and Annie drops Lori off and we watch from the POV inside the station wagon behind uh, Mike Myers and he gets out of the car yeah, and we hear those kids trick or treating and Mike watches as Annie goes into the house and the parents say good night and the camera sits behind Michael Myers. Yeah. We're getting there. Yep. We're, we're getting into where the stuff is about to happen. It's very simple. Yes. Yet incredibly scary as you're going along through the movie. And I think it's what we, the audience bring to it. Yeah. You know, there's not a lot happening. Yeah. We're driving around, we're smoking a joint, but we be, and, and I think and well and this is like uh, people who watch more horror movies today could speak to this and I can't. Mm-hmm. My assumption is there are no horror movies today going this long without oh showing intense yeah. scary stuff happening. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, this is like we talked about in, in you know the the pace of Jaws yeah. or the pace of you know it's like it, or, or the pace of The Shining is a really good example where yeah. you're spending which is two years after this yeah. also contains a lot of Steadicam also has a strong feeling of dread. Yeah. Man, is it possible that Kubrick watched Halloween? Certainly possible. Uh, I think what's even more incredible, though, Steve, is that horror in the 50s and 60s, as we said earlier, science fiction stuff, other world stuff, the blob, that kind of stuff, right? The large tentacles or the squid, right. the big octopus. It wasn't at my home it wasn't right. and this is also juxtaposition to that time in the 70s when serial killers started to become a thing like manson right serial killers this is this, this is only 10 years after manson like really 10 years after yeah. all of that sharon tate all or less than 10 years less. after sharon tate so you think about all that all of a sudden horror feels like it's no longer something well, that's and out zodiac there. And- yeah yeah zodiac all of that uh, Gacy, like all, it feels like it's all it, happening right then. Exactly, it doesn't yeah. feel any more like it's out there. Plus, the cults, all the, the, the yeah. all that stuff. So you get the idea that horror now is right around the corner. Horror now is next door. Horror now is all this other stuff, That's and you're great, just like, wow. I, it's a great point you made because I, I think because of course there were serial killers 
b- going way back in time. Of course. Uh, but that was just Jack sort the of river. Yeah, yeah. That was sort of just like literally under the rug. Yeah. Like, we're not going to talk about that. Right. I mean, there's the guy who inspired Psycho. Is that G- Gans or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy. In, uh, yeah. And it's like, but but it didn't have this. Because the other thing that's happening, too, is like the the rise of local news and the rise of. Oh, good call. You, right. You know, exactly. all the, this idea, because if you look at the world that is this uh, small town in Illinois or whatever. Right. They, they don't lock their doors. Yeah. They're not, you know, there's not a sense of fear yeah. in this town. And going forward, this is something I was thinking about. I'm not saying that Halloween and movies like it are why we're still so afraid in this country right now. Right. But the transition from the bucolic suburban world where there was terrible stuff going on back then sure. to today, which is technically much safer yeah. statistically. Yeah. And yet we are so much more afraid. I think this is a piece of that puzzle mm-hmm. is a movie like this. Yeah. Because now, like, you're walking down that quiet suburban street in the middle of the night and it seems scary. Yeah. Which I don't know that it did in 1965. Yeah, well, But true. after 1978, maybe so. Yeah. Um, so we're back in the, the Myers house, which has now fully become, we see this is the creepy house. Oh, yeah. And the sheriff and Dr. Loomis show up and we find out nobody's lived here since 63. Right. A lot of people think it's haunted, to which Loomis's reply is, they might be right. Uh, and they go inside and they look around and they see, I think it's a dead dog mm-hmm. that Michael Myers has been eating. <laughs> and and the, the, the cop's response is, a man wouldn't do that, to which Loomis replies, this isn't a man. <laughs> <laughs> He's really dramatic. He really is. <laughs> really Once dramatic. again, what is this thing? Right? Yeah. What is this thing? We're never told what it is. We never see any of Loomis's, like, in flashback, nope. having these sessions with Michael Myers, realizing that this thing is evil. It's just presented this way. Well, and all we've heard is that this was a kid who literally said nothing for 15 years. Right. So It, it was, only killed one person. It only killed one person. Yeah. I mean, clearly Loomis is correct. Yes, of course. About whatever we'll, we'll find out in later, yeah. But, but man, yeah. we, and we go, we go upstairs and there's this creepy high angle and it really does remind me of walking into the Psycho House. Mm-hmm. I think in terms of the way that it's filmed. I think you really studied that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and they go into the bedroom and we sort of, and Loomis kind of walks through like, yeah, she was sitting right here and how he could have seen her through the window. And of course, Loomis is absolutely right about what happened. Right. And then that window breaks. Like a gutter or something slams down and hit it, and Loomis draws a gun yeah. right away, and he calms down for a second, and the sheriff's looking at him, and I love the line. He goes, You must think me a very sinister doctor. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I do have a permit. Seems to me you're just playing scared. And now we get to hear all we're ever really going to hear about the experience. Right. Uh, and this is what Loomis says. He says, I met him. 15 years ago, I I was told there was nothing left. No reason, no uh, conscience, no understanding, and even the most rudimentary sense of life or death, of of good or evil, right or wrong. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. That's some heavy shit. Yeah, man. Especially to drop on a small town sheriff. Yeah. Right? Well, and to drop on a six-year-old kid. Yeah, good call. I mean, and and again, I will say, he is right. But I also, I keep going to this idea of, this also could be just a really fucked up uh, psychiatrist who's going to keep someone drugged up. Exactly. You know, for their entire life. Right. Uh, And then Loomis says, the sheriff's kind of going, what do we do? And he's like, well, he'll probably come back here tonight, so I'm just going to stay here. And you go and look around for him. And the sheriff goes, well, shouldn't we maybe announce it to the town or something like that? And Loomis tells him, no. Yeah. Which again is weird because with the doctor earlier, he said, we got to let people know how dangerous this thing yeah. is. And now he's saying, no, no, I'm just going to sit here <laughs> and wait and you're going to drive around and that's our best plan. Yeah. It does not seem like a good plan. He's moving. He's adjusting on the fly, I guess. I guess. Yeah. Well, and really, maybe this is another reason why I don't usually watch these movies is horror movies, people don't have good plans. Yeah, no, no. There can be no horror if everybody has a good plan. If everyone has a good system yeah. of let's have defensible positions and light everything yeah. up, and then that's it's not going to be a horror movie. Exactly. It's people doing stupid things. That is how you get to be a horror movie. Yes. Um, 
we're babysitting. Uh, Lori's reading a nice story to the kid, and he pulls out a bunch of comic books, which is what he really wants. Yeah. And we get a call from Annie, and we're talking to Annie, and a dog starts barking. And of course, we know why the dog's barking. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she she is not a fan of the dog. She's just trying to get the little girl who she's watching to take care of the dog. Lindsay, get this dog out of the kitchen right now. And we see a figure outside, and the dog leaves. And she tells Annie how much she hates the dog. Yeah. And as the do- after the dog goes out, Annie says she's got some big news. Because Lori is going to go to the homecoming dance. Yeah, that's right. Because she told Ben Trainer that you are attracted to him, and Lori is not pleased about this at all. <laughs> and this is cute, fun, high school babysitter stuff. Of course. Um, and th- as they continue to argue, Tommy walks away and goes over to the window, and we can see Lori in the background, and Tommy looks out the window, and he sees Michael Myers mm-hmm. at the other door. Yeah. And we hear trick-or-treaters giggling in the foreground, and Tommy runs back over to Lori, and he says, the boogeyman is outside. And Lori looks out, and what does she see? Nothing. Nothing. There's no one there. Go watch TV. Now we're outside Annie's door at the house across the street, and we hear the breathing, and Michael comes into frame, at which point Annie has somehow spilled butter or something all over herself, and immediately has to take all her clothes off. Well, of course. (laughs) As you do. Because <laughs> these are the tropes. Well, and this is, the, again, it's these things people talk about is what is the thrill of mixing sex and violence? Like there is some thing that, according to feminist theory, that men like about seeing the sexualization of women who are in totally unpowered and about to be killed positions. Oh, interesting. Yeah. A lot of, there's a lot of theory on these yeah. kinds of movies. Um, She calls out to Lindsay and says... You know, she's going to grab a shirt. Lindsay's the girl she's babysitting. And right. outside, Michael Myers breaks something as he leaves. And we hear it. And and she just thinks it's nothing. Right. And the dog is barking. And Annie calls for Lindsay to shut the dog up. Lindsay, Lester's barking again and getting on my nerves again. And then we hear the dog whimper. Yep. <laughs> Did Michael Myers just kill that dog? Yes. I think so, too. And we see a shot of the dog, but it's hard to see exactly what has happened to the dog. Clearly he does not like dogs. No. Well, he's like Terminators. Yeah. Is that, huh. is that dogs always bark when he's around? Um, and back in with Lori and Tommy, what movie are they watching? But Oh, I don't remember what movie are they watching. The Thing. The Thing, that's right. Yeah. Which he's going to direct in a couple of years. How in the, yeah, yeah, right. The original thing. Yeah, right. it's the original thing. Um <laughs> How funny. And again, the kid asks about the boogeyman. Yeah. And Lori says, well, there's no such thing. And he says, well, Richie says he was coming after me. Do you believe everything Richie tells you? No. Tommy, Halloween night, it's when people play tricks on each other. It's all make-believe. I think Richie was just trying to scare you. I think that's a key piece of information. Mm-hmm. And Tommy's going, no, I saw him outside. And she says, no, there was nothing outside. Even though she's been seeing the boogeyman and having him disappear the whole day. Yep. But she's not connecting them right now. And finally she says, The boogeyman can only come out on Halloween night, right? Right. While I'm here tonight, I'm not about to let anything happen to you. Promise? Promise. Annie's now outside, still wearing just that shirt. Um, Very sexy, too. Yeah. Um, it's about a woman, in, some about a beautiful woman in a man's shirt. A man's shirt. It's no, hot. it's a classic. It's a classic. Look, John Carpenter knew knew some stuff. Uh, and she goes out to the laundry room. the The lighting is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some reason the power is out. The door closes behind her, then opens, and we see Michael Myers through this sort of sheer, flowing curtains. It's a really, really well lit, yeah, well shot moment. And she kind of goes, "Hello, is there someone there?" Um, she looks outside. There's no one there. We close the door again. She kind of loads up the laundry. She wants to go out. The door is locked. Why does the door lock from the outside? Good question. It happens more than once in this film. Yeah. There's no doors that lock. Why would you have your laundry room locked from the outside? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, unless you're trying to keep people in the laundry room. Right. No, true. Um, and she calls out to Lindsay. Of course, there's no answer because Lindsay's watching TV. Uh, and the, ca- and the and those camera moves that make us feel the presence of Michael Myers, the phone is ringing and uh, Lindsay answers the phone and it's Paul, which is uh, Annie's boyfriend. Right. Um, and Annie's decided, well, I'm going to go out through the window. So she's trying to get out through the window. 
Um, and and Lindsay comes out and says, "Hey, I have Paul on the phone," and she finds Eddie stuck in the window. She helps her <laughs> out of the window. It's funny. Um, and the first thing she says, "Promise me you won't tell anyone about about right. this." Right. Uh, and they both walk up the pl- path. The phone is ringing again, and the first thing Lindsay says to Paul is, "She got stuck in the window. She'll be right there." <laughs> so she's totally violated the trust. Right. And then there's a very flirty conversation on the phone between Annie and Paul. Yeah. God, I've got a shirt on. That's all you ever think about. I think that's all you ever think about. That's not true. I think about lots of things. Now, why don't we not stand here talking about them and get down to doing them? Yeah. There you go. Look, woman says that to you on the phone. You got to handle your business. <laughs> you got you to get, get over there. Yeah, exactly. And that's really the question is, how are we going to get Paul over here? Right. And Lindsay doesn't want to go. So no. She's like, Annie, Annie goes, Lindsay, let's go get Paul. She's like, no, I'm watching TV. Right. And finally, she plays her trump card, which is, well, how would you like to go watch TV with Tommy from across the street? And that sells it. Right, exactly. Um, All tactics, man. Yep. And they walk across the street to the other house, and Michael stands up, and the music sting hits again, and there's the breathing, and he watches them go inside. Um and inside the house, Tommy answers, and there he brings them in. We're making some jack o' lanterns. We're watching some creepy show, which I think might be Forbidden Planet. At this point, is on. All right, because um, we go to the great. You know, we got the thing in Forbidden Planet. It's a good, good night of scary stuff. Yeah, and and what the and basically, Lori wants Annie to call Ben and tell her it's not true. And right. Annie makes the deal of like, I'll tell you what, you watch Lindsay for me, and I will consider doing that for you. Jesus. Because she wants some alone time with Paul, which yep. means she's going to have a whole house to herself. Yep. Annie leaves again, and Annie walks over to the car. It's locked. Yeah. Uh, she's kind of whistling to herself and singing to herself. She goes back into the house. Hmm. No keys, but please, my Paul. This takes a while. There's yeah. no music. Yeah. She finds the keys. She goes back outside. She has the keys in her hand. Yeah. And she opens the car door. I think that's great. <laughs> that is such good storytelling. Yeah. Because, again, we're ahead. Yep. We're like, wait, we know that door was locked before. Right. She didn't notice, even though she had the keys in her hand. Yep. Then she gets in the car, and what does she find on the windshield? It's all fogged up. Yep. And she's just as she's going, huh, why is that windshield all fogged up? Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere, from behind, Michael grabs her and starts choking her. And she's hitting the horn. First, she's hitting the horn by accident, yeah. I think. Then she hits it on purpose, and then there's a musical sting as he slits her throat. Yep. And she falls on the horn. Mm. This is over an hour into the movie. Yeah. So we have our, our, and again, this is sort of like Jaws structure to some degree, yep. which is you have the very scary thing at the beginning. And then while there are deaths in the middle of Jaws, it goes a long time before we're out to hunt the shark. Yeah. Um, but of course, while that's going on, inside the other house, they're just watching TV. Yeah. Um, just chilling out. Just chilling out. Tommy decides that it's time for him to pull a little prank. So while Lindsay is watching the creepy show, he gets up very quietly. He walks over to the window. He hides behind the curtain. And his intention, of course, is to scare Lindsay. Right. Because this is what we're doing. We're going to play pranks on each other on Halloween. But when he looks out the window, he sees the boogeyman. Yeah, man. Karen Annie into the other house. Freaks out. Freaks out. And then he bumps into Lindsay. They both scream. Tommy is freaking out because he just saw the boogeyman. Yeah. And Lori's like, no, calm down. There is no boogeyman. And she finally says, if you don't stop, I'm going to send you to bed. And he says, nobody believes me. And Lindsay says, I believe you. <laughs> Back in the Myers house, uh, Loomis is watching the house. Kids walk up. And this is clearly the I dare yeah. to go to the house. And they dare each other to do it and finally this one kid whose name i think is lonnie he starts to go and he gets really close he's almost at the door and loomis yells hey lonnie get your ass away from there (laughs) and those kids run like hell right (laughs) and he's very pleased with himself and then what happens a hand comes down and touches him on the shoulder another jump scare Mm -hmm. it's the sheriff yeah and the sheriff's really not believing this anymore 
it's just Halloween. There's some kids doing pranks and trick or treating, and they're parking. They're getting high, and he's just like, "This is crazy. I, I don't believe this whole thing." Well, if you break it down in a symbolism way, right? You break it down. Please. What does the sheriff symbolize? Sheriff symbolizes this idea that of Amer of like this country, like this section of people, like. Oh, it's not that bad. Oh, it can't be as bad as you say. Oh, it's totally fine. Right? right. Loomis is, no, you don't understand. If this keeps going, so many people are going to die. This is going to get worse and worse. It's not going to get better. We got to do something about it, blah, blah, blah. And then you have Lori Stroh, which is like the victim of all of this kind of stuff. Like, right. what does she represent in this whole situation, in this whole scenario? Because obviously we're about to get into all her friends dying, except her. What is what is her responsibility, to, or what does she symbolize in the situation? So it's it's just fascinating to me in that way. I think you make such an interesting point, and I hadn't thought about it quite that way, but I think you're totally right. Which is that there's the here's what the reality is. The statistics right. are you're safe, and then there's someone that says yeah, but there's the aberration. Is there's the crazy person, and we right. this is we deal with this in the news all the time. Is that there's the terrorist, there's the there's the uh, Ebola, there's the the, right. the you know the virus, there's the asteroid strike, there's the tornado, there's the the really scary thing, the serial killer. Yes, that could happen. Now th those things are extremely unlikely. Yeah, but if they do happen, they're really 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 scary. Right. And so you have the sheriff going like you know the calm, and the Loomis going no no this is the real deal. And what he says by the way is. Death has come to your little town. You can either ignore it or help me to stop it. That's his Hooper. That's Hooper. Yeah, totally. I'm not lining up here. <laughs> and I love the sheriff's responses. You know what Haddonfield is? It's children, family. You're telling us they're lining up for a slaughterhouse. Again, you're right. It's Jaws. Yeah. Yeah. Lining up for a hot lunch. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's funny. I mean, John Carpenter is... I'm, is of the generation of film students. Yeah. Filmmakers who had been film students, mm -hmm. which had never happened before. He and George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola and you know all these guys came out of this area of people who studied film. So John Carpenter did study Hitchcock. He did study Jaws. He did study all these films. Right. And now I think it's uh, uh, Lindsay and her boyfriend have shown up. They got some beers. They... Got a plan. We're going to go into the house. We're going to go straight inside the first bedroom on the left. Yep. And they're joking about who's going to rip whose clothes off. And he's going to rip hers clothes off. And then she's going to rip his clothes off. And he's like, well, and after that, we're going to rip the little girl's clothes off. <laughs> really weird. Which is fucked up and also yeah. funny. And they head into the house giggling. And inside, it's totally dark. It's totally dark. Yeah. Hey, Annie. Annie, we're here. Look around. Look for a note. He kisses her. They go down on the couch. He's on top of her. Uh, and the camera pulls away. Again, these unmotivated yeah, camera yeah, mo yeah. moves as we have the music starting. Um, and then we see a shoulder. So he knows. We know he's in there with them. Uh, right. And back with Lori. And we hear screams in the distance. And she's going like, you know, stop scaring each other. Yeah. And she looks out the window. And now she sees Linda's car. So everybody's having fun except for her. And the phone rings, and of course it's Linda saying, "What happened to Annie?" Right, which is surprising because it's like, well, Annie should have been back by then. Yeah, um, and it's kind of like, well, maybe she found her boyfriend, and they're off somewhere else. And uh, Lindsay realizes we got the house to ourselves. Yeah, which, by the way, when I was in high school, you had a house to yourself with your girlfriend. All bets were off. This is the. That's like, I mean, that's like a miracle. Oh yeah. Oh, I used to date this girl in high school that I would go speak to babysitters. I would go to whatever house she was babysitting at after mm -hmm. she put the kids to bed, but before the parents came home. Yeah. So we would play this game where we would <laughs> pool around and mess around until we saw the lights of the car. Then you'd go out the window? Or? Then she would time the close, the opening of the back door mm -hmm. at the same time as the front door was opening of the house. So she would open the back door. As soon as she heard the front door opening, she would open the back door for me to go out. And then she'd shut the back door slowly, softly, and then I would wait and then jump over the fence and run home or run to my car. Right. Yeah. It, 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 my first girlfriend, I, you know, my, my parents <laughs> had a kind of a long driveway. Yeah. And the where they would come into the house to where my bedroom was was the farthest distance you could go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I could hear 
theoretically when they started to come up the driveway. And so that gave me, we had time, like yeah. how much time we would have yeah, yeah, yeah. in order to deal with whatever we had to deal with. <laughs> but there were a couple of times where maybe I was distracted. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't hear that. And then I heard the garage door close. Yeah. And it was like, oh no. <laughs> we had to move really fast. <laughs> it's always, that's the great passage of youth. And by the way, clearly, you and I were both obvious targets for yes. serial killers and oh, horror films. Sure, I mean, sure, there's sure. No course, question about it. Every single time. Um, and we're in that bedroom, and Linda and her boyfriend are having sex, and Hey-o. the phone is ringing. Yeah. This is very irritating. And the question is like, should we answer the phone? And like, no, it could be the parents. If you can't answer right. when you're having sex in a strange house, you can't answer the phone. They decide instead to hang, to take the phone off the hook, which something strange happens with later on. Yeah. Um, and as they're back doing what they're doing, Shadow comes into the room as the music goes. Um, and then the music stops and they finish what they're doing. Okay. And this is that mix of sex and horror, which is such an important trope. Yeah. Is that I it, it, of like, do you let them finish? How long are we going to go? <laughs> and there's part of it is going like, well, Michael Myers' character wants them to finish. Yes. And part of it is that the young audience maybe wants them to finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And we'd talk about, you know, maybe getting a beer and who's going to go down and get the beer. And finally the guy goes down says, okay, I'll go down to get the beer. And she, and she lights a cigarette. So it's always weird in older movies watching how everybody smokes. Yeah. It's even weirder watching someone smoke in bed. Yeah. And it's really weird watching smoke in someone else's bed in a house that isn't theirs. <laughs> like, this doesn't seem... It's true. It's very strange. Um, and our guy's downstairs, he opens up the fridge, he grabs a beer, yeah. closes the fridge. And what are we doing as the audience during this scene in the kitchen? We're nothing but afraid. We're just looking for where is he going to come yeah, out Yeah, where is he going to come out of? He's, I know he's coming. Yeah. And again, this is the thing. There's no uh, way he's not coming. It's delaying, it's the delay yeah. that the fear comes from. Yeah. Is that, no, no, not him yet. It's almost delaying up until the point where we go like, come on already. Yeah, and then it happens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Every time he closes a door or something, you're like, he's going to be behind the... Yeah. Um, and then he starts to think that someone is messing with him. And this is the, here is the prank yeah. that he thinks is happening. Hey, who's there? You know, come on, come out, come out. And he's, you know, come out from here, come out from there. They're not yeah. there. Yeah. And then he opens another door and man, Michael comes out fast. Okay, Linda. Come on out. Yeah. Yeah. Not even not, like, and just pins him to the wall and lifts him off the ground. Yeah, which is so he is clearly supernatural. Yeah, he has superhuman strength. Yeah, he lifts him right off the ground, choking him. The knife comes out, stabs him through the belly, and the feet stay off the ground. Yeah, he pins him to the wall. Yeah, what I like is the way he almost marvels what he at what he's done. With the head tilt, the head tilt, the head tilt. Yeah. like you cannot understand. Like, oh, what have I done? I don't even understand what I've done. Yeah, it is. It is a, a lot of people talk about that head tilt. Mm-hmm. That that is like what exactly is happening with his character there. And the, by the way, the guy playing Michael Myers is Nick Castle. I yes. think his name is, mm-hmm. and he is a buddy of uh, of Carpenters from USC. He's right. a director. Directed the Last Starfighter. Oh, yeah. Directed a uh, House of Pain. He directed like okay. some movies. Okay, but this is frankly his big claim to fame. Right. He got paid. Uh, so Donald Pleasance got paid twenty grand. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Jamie Lee Curtis got paid five or six thousand dollars. Um, and I'm Nick, afraid to see what number this is. Yeah, twenty five dollars a day. Oh my god! Twenty five bucks a day. That's ridiculous. To pay one of the iconic, you know, killers yeah. in all horror films of all time. Right. I hope he got more the next time. Well, he's in the sequel, or he's in the uh, re- the one that came out recently. This recent one. Yeah, he, they use him too. Wow. Like the way of bringing Harrison back for Han Solo and all, like so they they wanted to bring him back as kind of an homage to the original huh. Halloween. Well, and, and and he kept asking Carpenter, "Well, what should I how should I act this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How should I walk? What's my motivation? Am I going fast? Am I going slow?" And Carpenter wouldn't tell him. He's like, <laughs> "Just walk. Just don't do anything. Don't put, and, and I think that's exactly the right direction. Is just stand there. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, and the only moment where there seems to be an emotional moment is this head tilt. Yeah. And I think that's why people catch it so much because other than that, he's just standing. It also it also makes you think of him as some kind of not necessarily human 
figure worthy of 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 I don't know worthy of negativity to because him Ted the tilt Ted is almost him marveling at yeah. his work and you're like oh that makes him somewhat of a child oh I see okay no it's it's an interesting moment right upstairs Linda is sanding down her nails door opens dude in a sheet still wearing his glasses yep um she kind of laughs and asks for the beer and then there's a long pause. They stare at each other. Yeah. Uh, and she's kind of sexily inviting him to bed. See anything you like? <laughs> Long pause. They stare at each other. She's starting to get a little irritated with yeah, him. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, what's the matter? What's going on here? No reaction. She doesn't have the beer. Right. Uh, still not answering her. Finally, she gets up and goes to call Lori. She picks up the phone and calls Lori. <laughs> yeah, she does. Why is there a dial tone? No dial tone? Why is there a dial tone? When she picks it up. Yes. Good question. Because they took the phone off the hook when, like a few minutes ago when they were Oh, set. right, right. So theoretically, so someone must have put the phone back on the hook yeah. in order for her to pick it up with the dial tone. And we saw Michael Myers was in the room yep, yep, when yep. we were having the sex. So, hmm. Did he put the phone back on, on the hook? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, He's and, crafty, and, that Michael Myers. And I'm sure that there are people who have watched this movie a oh, hundred times. Yeah. And I've watched it twice. There's like 30 videos online. What's wrong with Halloween? Well, and I'm sure someone will say, well, actually, what happened is that at yeah. 30, 38, and please tell us. So yeah. I'd like to know the answer to Yeah, that. lay it down for us. <laughs> uh, and she gets on the phone to call Lori. Lori answers. And before Lindsay can say anything, he comes from behind and starts choking her with a phone call. Yep. Uh, what a way to go. And what does Annie think? Or what does Lori think? Thinks it's a joke. Yeah, prank call. It must be a prank call. And again, we have the same thing of like thinking it's a prank when it's not a prank or thinking it's a, it isn't a prank when it is. Right. Um, and we hear louder sounds, louder scream struggles. And now Lori's starting to go, wait, are you all right? And of course, she thinks it's Annie that's yeah, on yeah, the phone. She doesn't realize that it's Lindsay. Yeah. Uh, and she goes down. And as she goes down, the sheet comes off and we see it's Michael Myers. Oh, my God. Um, great. And this is the first really, really good shot yeah. close of that mask. Annie. Annie. Yeah. Lori hangs up the phone, looks at the house across the street, and the lights go off. Yeah. She dials a number. Yeah. Nothing. No answer. Yeah. Ugh. It's all creepy, man. It's all creepy and craziness, and it's slowly but surely like it. In, it slow, it, like a shark. It kills everything until it gets to its. Well, of course, you could speak to it more than I can because I'm not. I didn't do a documentary shark, but like, it feels like uh, everything is being removed for him to get to what he wants to get to. Mm. Right? It's he could have just walked into the house and come after Lori, but the fact that he's kind of killing Lori's friends one by one for what we're about to see is uh interesting to me well he's also attracted by sex though it yeah. seems like that's yeah. one way because we have well, Annie walking around yeah and that's exactly what right the sets him off with the every, sister yeah. so because laurie is the pure one right and that's the one of course he has other uh, trouble killing exactly which again goes to one of the other tropes is final girl trope mm -hmm. and the final girl is through a lot of these movies and a lot of it's the purest one yeah that has the power to kill the you know it's like the virgin is the only one that can get the unicorn you know it's like yeah. it, like fits into this mythology I also think people take stuff too seriously, man. Well, that's what John Carpenter said. It's just a fucking horror movie. He said, no, I was just trying to scare yeah. you and titillate you. Like, yeah. that's what it is. It's a male director who's telling from a male point of view. Yes, you could accuse it of misogyny, I suppose, if you wanted to. Especially the uh, voyeuristic nature of some of these things. Because sure. POV style. But then again, it's that's a horror movie, man. It, this type of horror movie, I mean. Well, I, I mean, I certainly think there are reasons to say that we maybe don't make movies in the way that we used to because yeah. and that's we, a good thing and that's a good thing yeah but it's also but that doesn't mean i i guess where i always separate it is i'm mostly interested in the filmmaker's intention in terms yes. of meaning yes more than i am in this in the intention that someone else can put on a thing right right, right. you know like i took a a graduate course in shakespeare right and it was mostly like let's i think i mentioned this a long time ago uh -huh. but like let's analyze let's amnitize much ado about nothing in a neo-historical fashion, or let's look at Hamlet as a uh, Marxist realist, you know, story or, a, or a post-feminist narrative or post-modern. And I just couldn't, I, I just, that's not my thing. It's just Shakespeare, man. Well, it's like, well, because they, because what they were doing was 
using all of their ammunition of knowledge about yeah. one thing to completely ignore what was actually happening in the story. Exactly. You know, like, no, Hamlet was doing that for one of two or three reasons, yeah. but not in order to put forth a Leninist perspective because yeah. he didn't know who Lenin is. <laughs> that dude did not exist. Exactly. Anyway, we're back at the Myers house. <laughs> uh, Loomis is, you know, freaking out a little bit. Yeah. And, he, and, and to me, I'm going like, yes, of course you are, because you've been sitting here doing nothing. This was your big plan, was just to wait here. Um, they walked by. Yeah. And then he looks out as the music starts, fortunately, because I think maybe the music helps him to spot that station wagon. <laughs> and suddenly he goes, oh. He walks up to it, he sees the station wagon, and now he runs off. Now, I don't know how he knows what direction to run off. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The station yeah. wagon's here. Right. Um, but he, he heads off, and Lori makes a decision. Lori's already put the kids to bed. She goes downstairs. She gets her bag. She grabs some keys. She goes out the front door. Mm -hmm. She looks across the street. And now there's that slow walk. Everything's going to be slow. Yeah. And she gets across the streets. Um, and, and by the way, leaving kids alone in a house is something we would never do today. Of course not. No, that just doesn't. Which I think is... Yeah, the kids are fine. I guess. Okay. I mean, unless there's not a serial killer actually outside. Yeah. Generally, if you left a kid for 10 minutes, he, they'll be fine. How many serial killers kill kids? That's really rare. Yeah. How many serial killers are there? Almost none. <laughs> it's exceptionally rare. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, that's one of the problems. We talked about this when we did Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. It's like we've created this and there's Criminal Minds. There's all these shows. Right. Which really seem to tell us that serial killers are all over the mm -hmm. fucking place. <laughs> and they are not. There are a lot of unsubs in the world. Mm, yeah, right, not a lot. Exactly. exactly, not a lot. But yeah, you're right. I mean, for for away. for for a world with seven billion people of in them, yeah, there probably are a thousand. Yeah, you know, but not a lot. Right. Um, we get close to the house. We walk up to the stoop. We ring the doorbell. There's no sound. Yeah. Hits the knocker. Calls out. Mom? No response. Walks past the jack o' lantern, the same one that we saw in the credits. That actually, by the way, is real evidence they shot this movie in 20 days because otherwise that thing would have rotted. That's true. I mean, of course, they could have made more than one that looked like that. But she walks around the house, still calling out. She finds an open door. She walks in, calls out for Annie. No answer. Annie? The door closes behind her. The lighting in this sequence is great. And she walks into the kitchen. Now, what do we expect to see when she walks into the kitchen? The body of what's-his-face pinned to the wall. Yeah, dude pinned to the wall by a knife. No dude. Not there. We go into the living room. L tries the lights. They don't work. Now she's starting again. She goes, all right, joke's over. All right, you meatheads, joke's over. Yeah. Because there's still this, like, maybe it's a prank. And she's still re re trying to claim the power in the situation. But a joke's over. That's enough. Yeah. You know, like, uh, uh, stop it. Well, it's definitely stop being funny. Now cut it out. We'll be sorry. I don't think she believes a word of what I she don't said. I literally, my note here is not much conviction. <laughs> yeah. I don't think she it's believes true. it either. It's true. Um, and there's that high angle steady cam sh shot as she goes up the stairs. And of course, we're all going, don't go up the stairs. Yeah. yeah. Don't go up the stairs. And she she gets to the hallway and we see light coming through from one bedroom. Yeah. Which means Michael Myers must have hit all of the circuit breakers except for that upstairs room because none of the other yeah. power in the house works. Okay. So he has a lot of electrical skill. Yeah, he does. To figure that in addition to being able to drive a car, although he's never driven one. Yeah. She pushes the door open. She steps into the room. And there's Annie on the bed below the Judith Myers headstone. <laughs> headstone. Yeah. Oh, my God. She starts to whimper. She backs up, her hands over her face. Mm -hmm. She goes back towards the door, and Bob drops down, <laughs> hanging from some ceiling. <laughs> Great jump scare. <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis has a good scream. Oh, yeah. You man. know they did a scream for the audition. Mm -hmm. It is a really good one. Yeah. And, of course, she's going to scream again because she, because a cabinet opens, and there's Lin Lindsay stuck up, stuck up in there. Yeah, yeah. She goes back to the door crying and screaming and the music is building and Michael Myers comes out of the darkness, pulls out the knife, stabs at her and just, and kind of gets her, but not well. Yeah. And then she tumbles over the stairs and falls down to the first floor, yep. which saves her. Yep. And it's a great, though. I love the way they do the fall, the sort mm -hmm. of tumbling POV shot. Um, she runs limping away, tries to open the door, can't, runs to the kitchen door. It's mm -hmm. locked because again, the door locks from the outside. Right. Uh, tries to get out the window, it won't open, and Michael 
starts to stab through the door. Yeah. Again, something we'll see in The Shining two years later. Good call, man. Yeah. Arm comes through the door, opens it. Michael comes through, and finally, finally, Lori smashes that glass, opens up the door, and goes outside screaming for help. Uh, she runs, falls down, runs to another house, screaming, banging on the door. The lights come on. Yeah. Someone looks out the window. The lights go out. Yep. <laughs> uh, these small town, warm yeah. communities, they always look out for each other, don't they? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Less troubles around the corner. Yeah. She runs back to Tommy's house, can't find the key, calls to Tommy. Tommy! Tommy, it's me! Michael, you can see him coming. Um, she throws something back up the window. Tommy finally kind of goes, well, who is it? I mean, he was asleep. Yeah. Sleepy Tommy comes downstairs, opens the door. She gets in, and she's in charge. Yeah. I think she does really well. Tommy's upstairs. Whatever. Hurry right upstairs. Get Lindsay locked the bedroom door. Do as I say. The boogeyman. Hurry. Tommy immediately is like, is it the boogeyman? Yeah. And they, what I would say is, yes. <laughs> I think we have a boogeyman here. Yeah. She locks the door. She turns out the light. She tries the phone. Yeah. No dial tone. And then she looks over to a window, and there's a curtain that's moving because it's been open. Yeah. Man. Yep. She grabs a knitting needle, and she's hiding down behind the couch, and Michael comes over the couch, stabs at her, and misses. Yeah. And she stabs him in the head with a knitting needle. And he goes down. Yep. And she has the knife. I think we're going to be okay, John. <laughs> I think we got him. He's done. Mm -hmm. She looks over uh, the couch holding the knife. She sees him on the ground. Yeah. She drops the knife. Yeah, she does. <laughs> hmm. and here's my note here. I wrote, this is why I don't watch horror movies. Yeah, right, don't exactly. drop the knife. Don't drop the knife. Don't drop the knife. And fortunately, though, Donald Pleasance is walking down the street heading this way. Just just by happenstance. He he kind of, I guess, he knows. He looked into that kid's eyes. Yeah. He knows that he would turn left at the corner rather than right. He had a premonition. Yeah. And, and just in the perfect time, the cop car is also pulled up. And he says, okay, you go down the back of the streets and I'll go down the front. Yeah. And we're back in Tommy's house. And Lori is limping up the stairs. She goes to the bedroom. Tommy and Lindsay are there. They come out. They embrace. Yeah. And she goes, there's nothing to be scared of because we're good, right? Right. Sure, I left the knife down with the guy that yeah. just tried to kill yeah. me. I'm scared. There's nothing to be scared of. Are you sure? How? I killed him. And right as she's saying that, we see some shadows moving up behind them mm -hmm. because we know that guy's not dead. Nope. And, and Tommy does too because he says, you can't kill the boogeyman. Yeah. And that's when they see them. Ah! Uh, Get in there, come on, Tommy. And she sends them into one room and tells yep. them to lock the door. Yep. And she goes into another room and then kind of smart. She opens up the window to kind of make it yeah, look like she, she went out. Like she ran out. Yeah, yeah. Instead, she hides in the closet and trapped in that closet. And you see that shadow go by yeah. and stop and come back and try to open the closet. She's got that good locking closet somehow worked <laughs> out. It takes Michael Myers a long time to get through that closet. Very shining like though too, right? Yep. Like here's Johnny type thing. Totally. And you know what's fascinating with this, uh, with the closet and everything that happens there, she's trying to fool him, right? But she doesn't know what's going to work, what doesn't, what isn't going to work, right? And this scene right here is, along with the opening scene, are the two scenes that I remember most from the movie. When oh, the really? When you yeah, because this scene is so claustrophobic. Yeah. And it seems so useless for her to try to fight. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and the way and the, the 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 light bulb comes up, so we got that that light bulb inside, yeah. and then he comes through. Yeah. Finally, comes through the door, and she grabs a coat hanger. Mm. What does she do with the coat hanger exactly? Uh, she stabs him, right? And then there's the yeah. knitting needle. Well, the knitting needle we already did. That was downstairs, right? At the at the couch. I think she's stabbing him with the clothes hair, right? I mean, a it's hard, hanger, to, right? hard to stab someone with a coat hanger. Right. But it does seem to work because again, she drops the knife. Yeah. Um, he drops the knife. And she she gets the knife and stabs up at him. Wow. And he falls away. Yeah. And she breathes a sigh of relief because I think, John, we're good. Yeah, we might be good. I think we're good this time because now she, I mean, with the coat, we have the knitting needle <laughs> and the coat hanger and stabbed up at him with a knife. Yeah. So she breathes that big sigh of relief. Yeah. Gets up slowly. She's holding the knife in two hands. I'm really glad she's going to hold on to that knife. She comes out of the broken closet. She looks at him in the ground and 
Oh. You know, she drops the knife. Yeah. <laughs> drops the knife again. Oh, so frustrating. So frustrating. <laughs> um, and, I, and, and, and again, I, you know, it's like, this is part of the draw to yeah. this movie is having the, I guess maybe because you get to feel superior yeah. on some level to the characters in the film. It's like, uh, pick up the knife. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so true. Uh, and Tommy comes out of the door. They come out. And again, she's like, okay. I want you to go down the stairs and out the front door. And I want you to go down the street to the McKenzie's house. And I want you to tell them to call the police and tell them to send them over here. Oh, now, yeah. do you understand me? Yes. Go do as I say. I don't quite know. Is she so wounded that she can't go down the stairs with them? Or why is she not just saying, let's go? It's a good question. Maybe she is wounded. Maybe. I mean, she's, she's question, been hurt. Though. Yeah. And again, fans out there who know this movie backwards yeah. and forwards, you know, please tell me. Um, and they run. She kind of leans back against the wall. And what do we see in the background? Michael Myers. He sits up. Sits up. Like the Undertaker in wrestling. Just sits up. Fortunately, Loomis is outside and yeah. hears the kids screaming. And we've already introduced that he has a gun. Right. And so he gets up and runs past them. But inside, Lori hasn't even noticed Michael yet. Right, not yet. Um, and he gets up, and he's walking towards her in the background, mm -hmm. and he grabs her from behind, and yes. she struggles. Um, and she reaches up and pulls off his mask. Yeah. Well, she has been choking. Yeah. He was choking her. Right. Off the ground. Yeah. And then, so she pulls off the mask, and then you see this guy with a messed up eye and everything. Like, I don't know what was the point of seeing the face of Michael Myers. So Carpenter said he really wanted you to see that this was like an innocent looking normal person. <laughs> but I don't think that's the experience that I'm having no. in this moment. Also, not Nick Castle. Oh. That's not him. This is some actor they hired. Oh, interesting. Which okay. is weird to me. Like, I, I mean, I guess you get to choose. Yeah. You know, and maybe the actor they had to hire, they paid him more than 25 bucks a day. <laughs> whereas Probably. Nick worked for cheap. Yeah. Um. Okay. And there's Loomis. And he aims... Michael puts his mask back on, and once he's got his mask on, Loomis shoots him. Michael stumbles out of frame. Loomis turns around the corner, sees Michael standing in the mask, fires, a th I think, three or four more times. Yeah. And Michael falls out of the second floor window to the ground. And then Lori, there's this weird moment where Loomis comes over to Lori, and she says, What's the boogeyman? What's the boogeyman? Yeah. It's a strange line, I think. Yeah. And Loomis's reply is, as a matter of fact, that was. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he crosses back in front of her and he looks out the window at the ground and he's gone. So interesting little <laughs> acting thing about this <laughs> yeah. is uh, Pleasance came to Carpenter and said, there are two ways I can play this. Right. One way I can play this is I look down, I see he's gone, and I am shocked and afraid. Yeah. The other way I can play it is I look down and I see he's gone, and I go, I knew it. Yeah. And Carpenter goes, first of all, Carpenter never had an actor yeah. like so clear in his head about the choices to come up and like give him a, you know, the the menu items right. like I can do this or this. And Carpenter's like, I don't know, that's really interesting. Why don't you do both? And so uh, Pleasant said, sure, I'll do both. And they okay. do both. And Carpenter went, oh, obviously, it's the, I knew that would happen. That's the react. That's yep. the right reaction of the movie. Yep. And Pleasant says, I know. <laughs> uh, I knew, but I wanted to give you, it, basically, I wanted to give you the illusion that you had a choice. Uh-huh. Thanks, Donald. <laughs> Thanks, Donnie. <laughs> Sounds like Donald's sort of a fascinating kind of guy. Yeah. And as you say, the music starts up. Lori starts crying. <laughs> Donald looks around. And this is a weird moment where we see down the hall, we see the couch, we yeah. see the stairs, and we hear the breathing, mm -hmm. and it's growing and growing, and we see the open front door and the porch, and then we see the old Meyer house with and really creepy shadows of tree branches moving across it. <laughs> and that is the end of Halloween. Yeah, man. And her crying. And her crying, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just just no idea what to do, what she's experienced. Loomis without Michael. This is such a brilliant ending yeah. to a film that who knew if it was going to be successful or not, but they decided to keep what's his face, their main killer in the movie alive. 
Well, and this becomes very much a pattern for Carpenter because yeah. as we talked about with the thing, yeah. does the thing have a clear ending? That's right. It doesn't. And he, right. we did Big Trouble in Little China, which has that that monster jumps out of the very end. You're exactly. like, wait, what happened? <laughs> is that Carpenter knows? He goes, no, the point is to leave it open. Yeah. Don't don't close it all and wrap it all up in a bow. Right. Uh, which he doesn't at all. Um, uh, the reception of this movie, they open it up in Kansas City. It's yeah. It's in four theaters. Mm-hmm. Almost nobody comes. Wow. The next night, four times as many co- people come. What? The next night, two times as many people come. And it goes up and up. It, they start to open it. Then they open it in Los Angeles. Then they open it up in New York. And then they open it in Philadelphia. It slowly opens up around the country. Yeah. Slowly, the critic critical reviews come in. All pans. Everyone hates yeah. this movie. All the critics hate this movie. And it becomes a huge hit. By the end of the theatrical run... In the U.S. and in Europe, it had yeah. made seventy million dollars. Okay, making it at the time the most successful independent film of all time. Wow! And that percentage, which I think is like five percent, yeah, that Carpenter had, pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> did pretty well. And really, we could say not only did this have uh, eleven movies yeah. after it, including the one that just came out, yeah, but this really spawned a whole genre. Yes. I mean, it's not that the horror movie didn't exist. And before this, you know, in addition to the horror movies we talked about, but there's also Texas Chainsaw Massacres before this. But really, I think it's Halloween that really creates, without it, there's no Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, all these movies. Thoroughly agree. And and Scream, of course. And, right. you know, that all comes out of Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. And, and of course, th- th- like I said, there's all of this meanings is that, is it? Did it inspire sadism? Did it? Uh, is this a social critique of risque youth culture? <laughs> you know, uh, we've talked already about some of the feminist theories about yeah. it, but then there's also theories that says, well, because of the final girl trope, is that what this is actually about? Is that it's about the strong independent woman? Is that in the end there must only the woman can defeat the evil, the the pure evil? Yeah. Um, I'm down with that. One other thing about it is that, and this is true of of all of these movies, mm-hmm. is a to- almost total absence of adults. Is the adults just leave? Yeah, good point. You know, the parents are gone. Yep, they're no parent. They're kids on their own. Yeah, and yeah, we have Doctor Loomis come in at the at the very end. Um, and you think about in Nightmare on Elm Street, you think about all these films. Yep, there are no adults to help us. Hmm. Um, yeah, you don't have guns in slasher films in general. Okay. Because knives are scary. Right. Strangling is scary. Killing from a distance is not scary in the same way. Yeah. Um, and there's talk, you know, and this also relates to, again, feminist theory of that stabbing is in relation to, to rape oh, and yeah. intimacy. You know, yeah. it's intimate murders. There's a there's a uh, uh, another theory talks about the attack on suburbia, yeah. uh, like that. What this movie is really doing is deconstructing all the lies of the idealistic suburban space. Right, and in yeah. fact, it's no. There's all sorts of evil and horribleness underneath. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff about this, <laughs> and most of us. I go back to kind of what you said earlier, which yeah. is that it's just a movie. Yeah, it's just a horror movie. It's a fun, awesome yeah. horror movie that's a cut above the rest. You can't even compare Friday Thirteenth or Nightmare on Elm Street to this one. You just can't. Yeah, you can't. This is um. This is, and it's surprising because not all of Carpenter's shit is is art or some having some kind of message. Like the thing, this film. I think they live. Uh, they live has a message, but they're all genre films. Yeah, like, genre I, I think, films. I guess the is thing what I'm about Carpenter, say, yeah, I yeah. think, is that he's not pretentious. Like he's mm-hmm. like, no, I'm making an entertainment. That is the whole point yeah. of this. You yeah. know, I'm not trying like there might it's not that there's no meaning in it. Sometimes yeah. there's some meaning in it, but right. that's not the point. The point is is that you should have some scares or some thrills yeah. or some laughs. That's why we're doing this. Well, it's also the symbolism of this thing we can't kill. Yeah. This evil that we can't kill. The evil Absolutely. we can't kill is within ourselves. Fair. Yeah, yeah that's and, a good point. That's what I feel like as you're watching the movie, is because because there are theories out there that she because Lori's the only one who lives who's ever who sees besides obviously Loomis. Yeah. But do they have a shared delusion? Right. That kind of thing. Well, it's fascinating. Well, and I don't know what happens in all the sequels because I haven't watched them. Well, and now they've with this new one, they've killed all the canon from those other right. sequels, right? So in Halloween 2, she is apparently his sister. Mm. The younger sister that we didn't see in the opening of the film. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Right, exactly. And they try to retrofit all of that. Right. And then it's a whole thing where he's really... Like, Season of the Witch is a whole nother thing where the mask is the thing that turns right. you evil. And so it just goes on and on. And then... Uh, Lori Strode's niece, which is Daniel Harris. What's her situation? And then Michael eventually consumes Daniel Harris. Michael's spirit goes into Daniel Harris, which is the last shot. And Loomis is at the bottom of the stairs going, no, my God, no, not again, blah, blah, blah. So it, it is a whole supernatural thing. 
But it all comes from very simple. Be- I'm doing my final thoughts, aren't I? Without even knowing it. I think you are. Son of a bitch. It all comes down to this very simple premise of a film. Limited cast. Fantastically uh, uh, brought about. Well acted. And like very deftly and brilliantly done. Because it is simple yet so powerful in its uh, portrayal of this fear we all have of some kind of evil around the corner that we cannot stop and we cannot control. And the film never stops. I watched it, 2018 still holds up. Yeah. 40 years later. Yeah. And that's incredible. That's something, by the way, we didn't talk about is that this is the 40th anniversary. So yeah. We should have said that right back at the beginning. It is the 40th anniversary of Halloween. Um, My final thoughts, like, look, I said at the beginning, it's not my genre. Yeah. yeah. Um, And watching it this time, I'm actually really glad I did. And, beca- and the reason is, is because it, it, there's a thing about filmmaking that I think is so important, which is that what makes this movie work is what we, the audience, bring to it. Mm-hmm. Because really, there's not a lot going on in the film. Mm-hmm. Is that, and what John Carpenter understood, and maybe he understood this better than anybody since Hitchcock, mm-hmm. is that that camera that has that POV that gives you this, us the sense that someone is being watched. Right. Not that they have a sense of anything. They're just walking down the street. Mm-hmm. They're just talking about prom and Halloween and trick-or-treating. Right. But because we bring all this stuff to it, yeah. that all of the emotion, the scary stuff in the film, because it's actually not that violent a film. Yeah, it's yeah. not that bloody a film. Right. It's all being created by what we bring. And that's such a huge component of filmmaking. And I think there's there's no way to see it in such sharp relief except looking at this film. Yeah. So I'm really glad that uh, our Patreon fans and our other fans <laughs> pushed us to do this movie. I learned yeah. a lot from it. It was really a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what we think about Halloween. As I said, you probably have way more thoughts than we do. So please <laughs> share them with us on our Facebook page. Uh, cinephiles c-i-n-e dash f-i-l-e-s you can reach us uh, on YouTube and leave your comments there you can subscribe on YouTube you can subscribe on iTunes you could become a patron yourself and whether you are a patron that pays one dollar a month or or is one of the people bidding enough to pick a movie we love you all it's hugely yeah. hugely helpful we really appreciate it if you want to buy any of our films we've ever reviewed or listen to any of these podcasts you can do so on our website cinephiles.net that's c-i-n-e dash f-i-l-e-s dot net please visit the website look if you're one of those people who every week decides i gotta watch the movie before steve and john talk about it please go to the website you can click on the amazon prime link and watch it through us we would really appreciate it yeah. if you're gonna watch it anyway or buy the buy the blu-ray anyway do it through us as always you can reach me at sr morris john where can they reach you you can reach me at the roca says on twitter and on instagram i think Yeah, I don't think there's anything more to say, Steve, from my end. I think this is until Michael Myers strikes again. (laughs) That's it for the Cinephiles. This week, we'll see you next time on The Cinephiles.